Hello everybody, it's John with the EAP Society and we've got a very special episode today and a very special guest. This is my father, John William Heath. And uh, you guys uh, who have been in the uh, Elvis world for a while probably know him as a renowned Elvis collector. And so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how he got into Elvis and a very special piece that he has brought to show us. So first of all, Dad, um, how long have you been an Elvis fan? Well, let's see. It started when I was about 10 years old. And my mother and my aunt... Uh, we're going to Memphis to see Elvis at July the 30th, 1954 at Overton Park, and they couldn't get a babysitter. So my cousin and I, we were we tagged along, and then we had our best description of us was we both had crew cuts, and we it was hot. Oh, it was like 106 degrees that day. It was one of the hottest days in Memphis at that particular time. And we went out there, and... So they started out with the country and western performers coming out playing, and then they brought this young kid out, and they introduced him and Elvis Presley, and he stepped out on the stage. He was shaking like a leaf on a tree. He was nervous, but he he sang his first song, "That's All Right, Mama," and it uh, the crowd just was shocked. Everybody looked around. This is not country music. This is different. <laughs> so you were at the very first professional performance at the Overton Park we, show. We, we were there. That's What's very there? cool. And and it was an amazing experience. And from that point on, you know, I kept uh, up with Elvis. I was impressed with him. Elvis was the ch game changer. You know, as the as he came along, he changed the culture of music. And people before were listening to Hank Williams and country music and pop music, but not a rhythm and blues and rock and roll. And right. has this really changed the culture of, of the country and the world. Yeah. So uh, I know this story, but for everybody out here in, on, in YouTube land, uh, why don't you tell, how, how did you get started collecting Elvis? Well, I started uh, when my son was about two years of age. Uh, I, I had a uh, Elvis uh, on tour video, and he was, and that was John Michael, he was just mesmerized by the image and sound and likeness of Elvis. And I said, you know, this is this is something uh, I want to be involved with him. If he loves it this much, I want to be involved with him, see if, if he wants to go to Memphis and we'll go to the shows and different venues over there. And we did. And uh, that started into us collecting. And in the, my collecting career started with my oldest son, Jay, John William Heath Jr. When he was a child, he got into uh, American history and military, and we started collecting Marine Corps uniforms and posters and things of that nature and putting together a, a great collection of stuff. I wanted to, to be involved with my children and the things that they were in, involved in, not just say, well, I'll put you off and drop you off and, and things of this nature. I wanted to do things with them to experience their uh, growth, and, and it was fun. It was a lot of fun. All right, so you found uh, a lot of uh, a lot of remarkable Elvis items over the years that we've yeah. both found. We have been very blessed, and uh, you know the first things I started looking for, I wanted to if I could find the early promo pictures. Mm -hmm. If I could just get those promo pictures from '54 and '55, then I'd feel like I'd hit a home run. And we found those, and we've got six photographs from that time frame, all of them are autographed. And it's just an uh, amazing find over the years. But we worked really hard trying to run it down too. And we'll have to do an episode about those uh, promo photos to show people a complete collection of early Sun promo photos, all signed by Elvis. And all signed by Elvis. And... Now this particular piece that you brought with, with you today is very special. Well, let me tell you. So about... I want you to tell us about this piece. Let me here. tell you about this piece. What I'm holding in my hands is the birth of rock and roll. It started everything. Without this record, and uh, which is an acetate, an acetate is is a copy from the master tape to a, a format, putting it on a vinyl, and uh, they they made it. Uh, he Sam made about five or six of these, and they were sent around to local radio stations and. They were playing Elvis's first hit, or his very first song. I wouldn't have hit at that time. 
but they were playing it locally on a, a local radio station, WMPS, WHBQ, WHHM, uh, and uh, West Memphis radio station, KWAM. And they were playing it on the air to promote Elvis locally. Mm -hmm. And it started out, uh, he was an instant hit. Everybody really, really liked it. They, they couldn't tell if what it was. It was different. But this was an acetate of the very first song that Elvis ever recorded. So more or less, these would have been made by Sam to give to the radio stations before the records were pressed. That is exactly correct. And what they were trying to do, they were using these acetates to generate interest by the, the listeners to, if they liked it and they wanted to purchase it. So Sam could make a determination from this about how many records he needs to go and press. And so after they started playing it locally, it was a hit overnight. I mean, right. people were calling in the radio stations. Dewey Phillips, for example, had almost 30 or 40 calls in one night, and everybody's requesting, where can I get this record? Yeah. And so this was a hot item. This started it. This is the birth of rock and roll I'm holding my hand. What? So uh, tell us the story about, now I know the story, but for everybody out there in, in our audience, tell them the story about how we found this. How, how did you come into possession of this? I did a, the, the local newspaper in, in Memphis, the Commercial Appeal, did a story on me. And they were interested in my collecting and, and they called me and, and the, one of the writers over there contacted me and, and wanted to do an interview with me. So they came over to the house and, um, uh, they did a story on me and they put it out uh, in the local paper. And a lady that was in Poplar Bluff, Missouri, read the article and contacted me. And she contacted the school where I worked and, and said that she had something that, that I might be interested in. And I said, ma'am, what do you have? And she gave a description of it. And she told me how she got it. She said that uh, her best friends, uh, it was her mother's her best, mother's friend. best yeah. friend worked at the radio station WHBQ mm -hmm. and that uh, she had this acetate of Elvis's very first recording mm -hmm. and asked and gave it to her best friend's daughter who put it in an album jacket and put it in a record collection where she kept for 50 years. And then when she heard about me and read about me, she contacted me and wanted to know if I was interested in it. And I said, well, yes. I said, so we, my son and I, we drove to Poplar Bluff, uh, Missouri, and met her at the Walmart store. Yeah, uh, we, we met her at the Walmart store. This was back when uh, Walmart had little uh, diners in them, kind of. And, uh, cantinas is what they were called. Little cantinas, if you will. And uh, the, the lady uh, brought in what appeared to be a Lawrence Welk album because it was exactly a 1950s Lawrence Welk album cover. That's exactly and then right. she took this out of it. And, we and out. <laughs> yeah, as soon as I saw the flip side, which this is framed, I can't show you the flip side. I might have a picture that I can put up on the screen. Uh, I almost passed out yeah. because not too many months before we met her, we had been to the opening of the new exhibit at Sun Studio. That's exactly right. And we were talking with Sam Phillips, and I was just peppering Sam with every question I could about recording That's All Right and the process and when he played the song for Dewey. And I remembered him saying that, uh, that he, had a presto, he, he had a presto lathe that he made the disc on. And I didn't know what a presto lathe was, so I asked him. And he said, well, you know, a lathe is kind of like a, a record cutter. It's a machine that's sort of like a record player, but instead of playing them, it cuts them. And this one was made by Presto. Well, on the flip side of this disc, which does also have Blue Moon of Kentucky on it, part of the label is missing, and you can see the Presto logo on yes, the disc, you can. Yes, you can. which that checked a box immediately for me. Right. So just a couple of years after we got it, actually, it was several years, several years several after we, years got we got it, you were asked to put this on display at the Johnny Cash Museum in Nashville. That is correct. I was asked to do an early exhibit on Elvis for the Johnny Cash Museum, which Bill Miller uh, had heard about me, and he uh, heard that I had some really er early artifacts. And so um, I loaned my collection to the uh, Johnny Cash Museum, and in it was this record. Well, and Jerry Phillips was, was, was Sam's son, was, was there, and he saw the record, and he kept looking at it, and he see he saw where the uh, the lines at the bottom had been scratched out about naming the man, 
of the band, members of the band, and then it had a hand written on the bottom of Scotty and Bill and, and 209, and Jerry looked at it and he said, that's my dad's handwriting. He verified Sam's writing on the record. And it, it made it more I remember when you told me that, because I didn't get yeah. to go to the opening, and you said, you said, John, you're not going to believe it. <laughs> Sam Phillips' son just told me that's yeah. his writing on the yeah. label, and I flipped, I because I don't know if you guys can see this. We'll get a close-up so you can see the label, but the label says, son, pre-release sample, that's all right, Elvis Presley, and then typed on the label is, and Scotty Moore's band, and then someone has taken a pen and crossing out, crossed out and Scotty Moore's band and added, and Scotty and Bill. And it, it's 209. 209. So, and, and Jerry confirmed that was his dad. He confirmed that's Sam Phillips' handwriting so, on the label. But the, the record is, is the beginning of the birth of rock and roll. Now, before you had it on display at the Johnny Cash Museum, we'd actually gone through a couple of other steps to validate that this is an authentic piece before we had bought it. First thing we did was I took high resolution photos of the label to compare to high resolution photos of the labels of my happiness and the uh, second acetate, I'll never stand in your way. And I validated that the typography of the typewriter is exactly the same as those other two acetates. So this was 100% typed on the same typewriter that made the the labels for my happiness and I'll never stand holding away. holding this record is like holding the birth of rock and roll it is without this record but there's one other thing that we did to validate this shortly after you bought it and you remember uh you do you want to tell him about taking this over to see John uh, at uh, Arden Studios I, I went over and and had the record digitized and I was scared to death um Arden Studio and John Fry I'd contacted him on the phone and told him what I had, and I told him I would really like to make a digital copy of it, and would he be interested in doing it for me? And I told him I'd be glad to pay him. He said, yeah, he'd do it for me. So we drove over to Arden Studio. And I was scared to death when they put the needle on this vinyl because this vinyl's uh, almost 60 years old, and you didn't know if it was going to come off or what was going to happen. But he made a digital copy of it, and he was blown away by, by the sound. And so we have a digital copy of the original record that was played on WHBQ. Well, that's all right, Mama. That's all right with you. That's all right, Mama. Just any way you do, that's all right. That's all right. So not too long after you took it over to John Fry at Ardent, you sent a copy of the transfer to Ernst Jorgensen to listen to it. And he told you something that I think is pretty interesting. Well, he said it, it was the exact sound that of, of the original. He said he would, without a question of doubt, this was the real deal. Right. This has got the original dry sun sound of 209 on it. We'll play a clip. Uh, if 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 I can get you to send me a copy of that transfer, we'll yeah. play a clip for everybody okay. so they can hear what we'll it sounds fine. like. We'll be fine. And um, that's very important because uh, for reasons I'll discuss after the break, but we've got Ernst validating this for us. We've got the typography of the label. You've got confirmation that that is Sam Phillips' and handwriting. And you got Jerry Phillips. Exactly. Confirmation on it. So th this is about as confirmed as you can get for a it, Sun Acetate of That's All Right. Is, it is the very first record that Elvis recorded at Sun Studio. The very first one that was released. Very that's true. And released. this is before the record was released because yes. it's a pre-release sample. And they made about five or six copies, which they sent around to local radio stations to play. And this is one of the copies that, that uh, were, was pressed. And that was as it. far as we know, this is the only authentic copy we have seen circulating. That is correct. There are some other uh, pretenders That's that have been circulating, but the only one that I, I would swear by is this one that we've got right well, here. So... Thank you, Dad, for bringing this on to show it to us. I'm sure all of you guys out there really enjoyed getting to see it. I hope I enjoyed it as much as I presented it. Uh, yeah. As I did in presenting it, because this is the foundation of Elvis Presley right here. Without yeah. this record, there wouldn't have been an Elvis Presley, you know. There you go. This, this started it all. So 
I'm going to come back and answer a few questions about uh, different acetate I've been getting a, a couple of queries about after this break, so don't go away. And welcome back. I hope you guys enjoyed hearing my dad's story about finding an original 1954 acetate of That's All Right Mama on the Sun label. Well, before it was really on the Sun label, but you get the idea. All right, anyway, the reason we did this uh, episode today was because I've been getting a lot of questions from people who have raised concerns with the That's All Right acetate that was unveiled at the Graceland birthday celebration this morning. They, uh, in, in order to celebrate Elvis's birthday, unveiled this uh, That's All Right acetate that they have apparently just purchased and they played it for the crowd. And so since I have an acetate of That's All Right from 1954, they were asking me my thoughts on it and raising some concerns with what they uh, believe they saw or heard with the, uh, the presentation of this song. Now, I'll get the small stuff out of the way first, but I'll say their concerns are valid. Um, the first concern was that apparently the uh, video that's posted to YouTube of someone playing the acetate on a small record player appears to show the record playing at 33 and a third RPM. Now, if that's the case, that would indeed be a huge red flag about the authenticity of that acetate. Because as we know, at the time, Sam was not producing 33 and a third RPM records at Sun. Everything was 45 and 78. Um, he was all single business until the late 50s when he had some albums by Johnny Cash and those kind of guys, but well after Elvis had left uh, the Sun label. Now, there are some Sun acetates, or some Memphis Recording Service acetates, that were done in, um, in Sam's business of recording anything, anywhere, anytime, as he advertised, where he would do like church services or funerals and stuff like that. And those acetates are usually large discs, and they, they can be recorded at 16 RPM. And I know of lots of acetates that are at 78 RPM. I don't know of any legitimate acetates that are at 45 or 33, but I wouldn't necessarily rule out an acetate based on that. It's weird. It's an enormous concern. I wouldn't buy an acetate if it was presented to me at 33 and a third RPM. But it's within the realm of possibility, perhaps, that it could have been made that way. Because um, there were lots of different stuff made. Now, all of the Elvis acetates we know about, My Happiness, um, the uh, I'll Never Stand In Your Way, the That's All Right acetate that we have, are all 78 RPM. And that, that was the industry standard at the time. It's what was handed out to uh, radio stations. You know, they were used to getting the pressed records that ran at 78, and so... If you were making a acetate for a radio station, you would certainly want to give it to them in a format that they would be accustomed to. And the 33 and a third format wouldn't become popular until much later than 1954. Um, the second and far more vital concern that has been raised is that the sound on the acetate played at Graceland has a lot of reverb on the That's All Right. Uh, it's drenched in reverb. And that is enormously problematic. That is so problematic that I would say if that is in fact the sound on that disc, which I'm gonna allow that maybe, maybe they would have played something different over the top of this record. I don't know why you would do that. I can understand like if you're presenting something and you wanna make it look like it's from a record, player, but you don't really want to put the needle on it, you might have a transfer that you've done ahead of time that played over loudspeakers while you appear to play the record. It didn't look like that was what was happening from the video, but I can't tell for sure. I will say this, if the That's All Right with Reverb is in fact on that disc, you can automatically say that it is not a legitimate sun acetate. And I'll tell you why I know that. So. Reverb in the 1950s was kind of a pricey thing to do, right? And Sam, great record producer, but he was a great record producer working on a budget. He did not have the ability to produce reverb at Sun Records. He just didn't have 
the capability, right? Because back then, they didn't have the spring reverbs or the plate reverbs like they have now. They had reverb chambers, which were these big rooms, usually with tiled walls, that they would place a speaker in. And they could then pl play a sound on that speaker that would reverberate off of all of the tiles, creating this rich reverb that had a long extended trail that you could then layer over the original sound on the mastering from the from the mastering desk. Um, so it was quite pricey and Sun Records did not have a rever reverb chamber, but Sam had come up with a process that was sort of a simulation of reverb. And it actually wound up being a signature sound of his. It's called slapback echo or a tape delay echo. And he accomplished this by, uh, he had two Ampex 350 recording machines and he would take the mic signal, the dry mic signal that went into the Ampex machine, it would record it and it would send it to the second machine which would also record the sound and then a split second later, send the sound back to the first machine. And so this, this creates this kind of um, really neat doubling effect. Like if you've ever heard Elvis uh, sing Blue Moon or Tomorrow Night, that is a great example of what tape delay echo sounds like on a voice. Now tape delay echo is different from reverb because reverb has a long cascading trail with lots of repeats of the sound and tape delay echo only has one repeat. So it's a lot drier and kind of stickier sounding than reverb is. Uh, it's a very, very cool sound though. Now here's another issue. While Sam did have tape delay echo, and you can hear tape delay echo on Blue Moon of Kentucky, on That's All Right, there is nothing on the master. The master of That's All Right, as recorded at Sun, was completely dry, bone dry. There were no effects of any kind. And why was this the case? It's the case because when Sam brought Elvis and Scotty and Bill in the sun on July the 5th, it was an audition. He didn't expect to actually get a master out of that session. And so they stumbled upon That's All Right, and it was a great record and he kept it, but it had no, it had no tape delay echo in it. He hadn't set up the second machine. He, like it, you know, tape delay echo, it requires a little bit of setup to get it working in the studio, uh, and he didn't have it set up that day. You can hear uh, Harbor Lights and I Love You Because and the alternate take of That's All Right and That's All Right and they're all bone dry. Like there is nothing on them. And that is the way that they were released on Sun Records because Sam did not record the tape delay echo when he had made That's All Right. And it was issued as dry as it was recorded. So all of the original Sun Records and all the original Sun 78s and 45s and all, well, and what I'm saying is all the original acetates as well. Uh, if they actually came from Memphis Recording Service, they will not contain reverb because Sam Phillips did not have the capability of producing reverb at 706 Union Avenue in Memphis, Tennessee in July of 1954. It just didn't exist. You can listen to all of his other recordings besides Elvis, like none of them have reverb, none of them. So that is an enormous concern. Now we do know when reverb was first applied to the master of That's All Right. In late 1955, when RCA purchased Elvis's contract, the first thing they did was decide to reissue all of those original Sun singles on the RCA label. And in the process, I guess one of the RCA engineers, for whatever reason, decided that That's All Right needed to be livened up. So, he used their much fancier studio to add some reverb to the master and all of the masters of That's All Right from the RCA era, starting with that first single that was either December 55, January 56, and going all the way up to the point where it was finally uh, restored around, I, I want to say 2004. They finally got Kavan to restore 78 and put out the original dry sound. Um, all of those issues in the middle had the reverb on them. So if you've got a record that has reverb on it, the audio had to have been sourced from an RCA source that could have come no earlier than December of 1955, 
which makes this hugely problematic if you are claiming that this is the acetate from July 1954. That's quite a thing that has to be explained. Anyway, I hope this information has been helpful. Um, I don't know what the situation is with the Graceland acetate other than what we've seen. If it does in fact have the audio that we all heard uh, today on the broadcast and the YouTube video, then th there's no physical way it can be an acetate from July the 5th, 1954. It just can't because Sam did not have the ability to produce reverb in Sun Studio. Um, kind of a bummer, but I uh, hope this is clarifying. And if, uh, if, you know, if it turns out that this is in fact, that the audio on that disc is wrong and uh, any, anybody out there needs my help to kind of substantiate what I've said and prove that the original uh, Sun sources will not have reverb, um, give, contact me. I'll be glad to help in any way I can. And Ernst Jorgensen at BMG, um, Sebastian, who works on a lot of the FTDs, these guys know all about this stuff too. They can tell you in far more technical detail than I can about the uh, recording process that Sam Phillips used. Um, I hate to see anything misrepresented, uh, especially to the estate of Elvis Presley. So I hope, I sincerely hope that uh, the audio we heard today was not what is on that disc, because if it is, there's zero chance that it's a real one. Um, and kind of a bummer, but anyway, hope this helps. Um, uh, as always, uh, be good to yourselves, be good to each other, and always, TC. My society, my society, here are those friends I want to see. Don't need no high society to get me where I want to be. My society, yeah, that's for me. Oh, my society, yeah, that's for me. Oh, my society.